Welcome to Module 3 of Making Spatial Decisions Using uh, GIS and Remote Sensing. And in this module, we're going to be exploring spectral signatures. So here is an ArcMap session showing the Chesapeake Bay area. And you can see that there is a multispectral image that is loaded in the table of contents on your left. And it has the file naming convention uh, with different Landsat parameters, which we will explore when we talk about projects more. And then there's an underscore MTL. So this is showing you um, that it is indeed a multispectral image. So spectral signatures are essentially plots of the reflected radiation of different objects. And these are collected using different wavelength filters of the satellite sensor. All of these parameters are set up by the engineers and the technicians for the satellite platform. And what we use as GIS analysts is the information that you can see depicted here. So this is a diagram representing uh, incident energy from the sun. So this would be passive remote sensing and it's showing you a reflection off of granite, sandstone, vegetation and water. So there are different curves that are shown in the graph and the axes on this graph are not clearly defined but just for illustrative purposes uh, the x-axis will represent wavelength and the y-axis is percent reflectance. So let's take a look at a more clear um, graph of that. But before we jump into that graph, again, let's pause and think about what is remote sensing. So we've defined it as collecting information about an object without being in contact with that object. So when we're working with the tools of re remote sensing, it's important to think about what those tools are telling us. So a spectral signature, well, a definition, it's a pattern of electromagnetic radiation that identifies a chemical or compound. So this graph is much clearer and easier to read. On the x-axis, we have wavelength in micrometers, and on the y-axis, we have percent reflectance. We have portions of the visible, near-infrared, and short-wave infrared spectrum represented Visible goes from 0.4 to approximately 0.8 micrometers, then near infrared is slightly longer wavelengths, and then short wave infrared is longer than that. So these three curves are representing the spectral signatures for corn, tulip poplar, and soybean three different kinds of vegetation. You can see that there are low areas which are low reflectance, but that means that they are high absorption. So there are two main areas of chlorophyll absorption which are shown at the end of the purple arrows, and there are three areas of water absorption which are shown at the end of the yellow arrows. So you can see that the spectral signatures are very sophisticated and um, that there is a di very distinct difference in different species of plants. There's also a very distinct difference between healthy vegetation and stressed vegetation, for example. So by understanding spectral signatures, uh, we can interpret what is occurring in the phenomenon on the earth. So for vegetation, how does it work and why does it work? Again, remember, it's a pattern of electromagnetic radiation. So this diagram is showing you that there, there are four representative portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that we're considering. Um, reflected infrared is the white arrow, then we have red and blue portions of visible light, and then green portion of visible light. So red and blue arrows are only going into this representation of a leaf because red and blue are the portions where photosynthesis occurs. The green and the infrared are being reflected, and this is why healthy vegetation appears green to our eyes, and there is a strong reflection of infrared energy. Now we as humans don't see infrared energy, uh, but we can sense it with our remote sensing tools. So objects and materials can be distinguished from one another by interpreting the portions of the spectrum that they reflect and absorb. Here's a typical scene. If we start on the left, we can see um, there are urban areas, there's a coastline, there's shallow water and deep water, 
and then in the upper right hand portion of this image are clouds. So as we work through the labs and the modules, you will get a better sense for how different objects are going to behave according to spectral signatures. So for instance, um, this would be shallow water or perhaps even uh, a sandbar or something uh, bathymetric, which is under the water. And that's going to appear different than the deep water, which is shown in blue here, which will appear different than land, which is shown with this yellow circle. And this area, which is mostly urban and coastal, will also have a unique spectral signature. So with the electromagnetic spectrum, it can be drawn in several ways, and the information is always going to be the same and consistent. So in this example, the wavelengths are shown uh, from the largest to the smallest. So radio waves are the longest portion of the electromagnetic spectrum. Then we have microwaves, infrared, visible light, ultraviolet, x-rays, and gamma. So this should be a review from the lecture portion, and I encourage you to read more in the Canadian Journal, uh, I'm sorry, the Canadian uh, tutorial that is available on Blackboard. Remote sensing mainly uses the ultraviolet spectrum, visible spectrum, infrared region, and then with active remote sensing, radar will use microwave, and LIDAR uses the visible spectrum. So the concept of a spectral signature, it's another name for a plot of the variations of reflected or absorbed electromagnetic radiation as function of wavelength. And it gives rise to the widely used approach to identifying and separating different materials or objects using multispectral data obtained by remote sensors. So on this graph, we have our wavelength in nanometers on the x-axis, and the percent reflectance here is shown in a logarithmic scale because we're comparing objects that have very, very different signatures. So for instance, snow and ice is the most reflective uh, material on Earth. Whereas at the bottom, we have two signatures, one for clear water and one for turbid water. Water is the most absorptive object on Earth. In order to compare these two extremes, plus the vegetation and the soil types you see in the middle, this scale was drawn as a logarithmic function. So let's look at the curves for just a moment. So again, snow and ice and clouds are very, very reflective. And so they're going to have a high percent reflectance. And then water is very absorptive with electromagnetic energy. And you can see um, that there are representative curves for dry soil and wet soil, as well as two different types of vegetation shown here. So revisiting again, we have seen this graph uh, earlier, uh, I want you to pay particular attention for those low areas. Again, those are the absorptive areas. With chlorophyll, it is the portions of the red and blue visible spectrum, and the water absorption is going to occur because of different water content in the actual leaves or the vegetation. So here we consider um, the different curves for limestone, sand, vegetation, dry soil, and water. And it's also showing you a representation of the information that's collected in bands. So if we have a blue band, a green band, and a red band, so for instance, let's take the red band first, which is band three in this example, it is collected between approximately 0.78 and 0 0.90 micrometers. Then we have a green band, which is collected at approximately uh, 0 0.60 to 0 0.70 micrometers. And then the blue band shown here as band one is approximately 0.50 to uh, about 0.58 micrometers. So the idea of this graph is showing you that each sensor has a band designation, which again is established by the 
engineers on that sensor before it's launched and that band will collect information only in that portion of the electromagnetic spectrum and then the curves are overlaying on this example here um, for those different elements. So here's an example of a Landsat uh, TM channel and sample spectral curves. So you can see that four bands are represented here, one, two, three, and four. And these are um, bands or channels on the Landsat TM satellite. So it collects information in bands and each band collects information from a different range, range of wavelengths. This information when analyzed with digital software produces the spectral signature curves. So for this exercise, you will be submitting deliverables and uh, please check Blackboard for uh, the specifics on your deliverables and uh, you will submit a chart and a graph of spectral signatures of concrete, grass, and water as identified from your image of Chesapeake Bay. You will also need to submit a chart and a graph of spectral signatures of different types of vegetation and a chart and a graph comparing spectral signatures of clear and turbid water. Here is an example of a spectral signature compari comparing coniferous forest, deciduous forest, and crops. Here is an example of what the water, grass, and concrete will look like. Yours may be slightly different, and in fact it should be, because what we're doing is we are analyzing different portions of the image. So don't worry if your results are slightly different. Um, I'm just showing you these uh, four examples, and with this lab, you can submit the spectral signature showing the different bands on the x-axis and the digital numbers on the y-axis. And here are the spectral signatures for vegetation, coniferous, deciduous, and crops. And finally, the spectral signatures for water with a uh, distinguishing difference between clear and turbid water.